Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. Okay, let's do a little middle cough. Mailbag. Very easy to get involved. Very simple. Instagram, at John Middlecoff. Fire in those DMs. At John Middlecoff, my name, two Fs. Fire in those DMs. Love the pod. We all know DK Metcalf has some serious anger issues. And I think he only, the only reason he has been in the NFL this long is because he was drafted by Pete Carroll. I, I'd also say he's pretty good at football. Uh, probably a bigger reason than the uh, than Pete Carroll. If DK was to go to another team, what would it be and for how long? Well, he's under a big contract, right? Him, A.J. Brown, and Debo Samuel, was it not last two seasons ago, got large contract extensions. It actually kind of hit me this morning. I, I was at the gym, and uh, I flipped on Lombardi's podcast, and he mentioned, you know, he was talking about the Chiefs trade. And, and one thing the Chiefs, with their trade, didn't allow themselves to do, and, you know, I, I think they were playing through the different scenarios, is that cap space for Sneed when they franchised him, I don't have the exact number off the top, you know, on me. I, I think it was $21, $22, 23000000 million was just sitting there, right? I mean, he was taking up space. Once they remove him, they get the cap space. It, honestly, it might be more now thinking about it. Whatever the number was, it, it was large. And that could have enabled them to sign guys. And I'm kind of sitting there doing what, you know, a, a chubby guy chasing skinniness does, walking on an incline, uh, holding, but walking on the incline. And what if the Chiefs, do I think they would trade pick 32 for DK? I wonder if they think about it. Now, I, I don't know, you know, big picture, part of the space, you know, signing their own guys, right? They have some young core pieces on the offensive line, a guard, a center, a good linebacker uh, that are not going to be cheap. But listen, I, I know the way Andy thinks. Right? Andy likes sweet players, right? I mean, think about some of the guys the last 15 years that he's used a lot, from Deshaun to Macklin to Shady to what he did with Jamal Charles, to drafting Tyreek, and uh, obviously Kelsey. I would imagine he likes DK Metcalf. And think about DK Metcalf with Patrick Mahomes. Now, it takes two to tango. Wouldn't John Schneider just want DK Metcalf on his team? To me, part of the draw of Seattle is the nucleus they have. But Maybe they go, hey, it's a good receiver draft. Now, there are financial ramifications on doing this, but... You never know. It, it it honestly, it's crazy. It, it crossed my mind today. Would the Chiefs sniff around on DK? They have a new coach. They don't have a new GM. And I would guess John likes him. I don't know why John Schneider wouldn't like DK. But to me, that anger issues, like he, he struggles controlling his emotions, which they got penalized a lot oh, last year and over the last couple of years, right? But that's, he doesn't get any trouble. Uh, I I can live with that. I mean, he's a very very talented player. He he really is. I I think he's closer to the modern day Terrell Owens. Terrell was probably a little more fluid. Uh, but this guy's high end speed, his physicality, like To, doesn't have the greatest natural hands. Right, I, I wouldn't call him like uh Devonte or you know Tyreek has great hands, like just a natural catcher of the ball. But he's definitely good enough. And he's just, there's nothing quite like him in the NFL. So I, I would, it wouldn't shock me if he ever were to become like, hey, we'd be open to it, uh, that they would sniff around. The swivel hip drop tackle ruling and social media sentiment around it reminds me a lot of the crown of the helmet rule change from a few years back. Now that the NFL has classified what they're looking to penalize, I actually don't foresee this being a huge deal. And I think within a year, this will be pretty easily eradicated without changing the game in a significant way. Of course, social media disagrees and is freaking out per usual. Yeah, I mean, you can't worry about the, the freak out. I do think anytime a rule happens, 
it's you got to wait to see the way that it's legislated come the games. Like, how are they calling these? Uh, I heard some people say that they feel it's going to be more of a fine based than, you know, ejections and penalties. Uh, time will tell. Uh, obviously, there are going to be some obvious times it happens. My entire take, the, the crown of the helmet, there was a vicious violence that existed in the old NFL that, listen, I came up on and made me fall in love with the NFL. It intimidated me about trying to play high school football. I remember just being, football's intimidating. It, it's a it's an intimidating sport. I always had a lot of respect when I worked in college football you know, that that level of guys that, that were hard hitters, and then obviously the NFL is the highest level. But they, they they didn't they wanted the violence that led to the injuries out, obviously because of the lawsuits. I, I this one to me, I, I I don't like when you launch yourself, I I'd be fine going back to the old rules. They never are, but the launching uh you don't have to launch yourself. Like, you know, you don't have to leave your feet. If you're going to, ta- it doesn't mean you're always going to tackle the guy. This one by any, you're taught this in peewee football up through the NFL. At the end of the day, if I'm in a one-on-one position or I am the guy in a gap and the, and the guy is running at me, my only job is to get him on the ground. Like form tackles and how you're taught tackling at the lowest level of football kind of goes out the window. Because if you're trying to tackle Saquon, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, whoever, CeeDee Lamb, I mean, all, part of this, a little like the quarterbacks, who are they trying to protect? The star players. Right? Mark Andrews was lost basically for the season last year because of the injury. That easily could be take the best 10-plus teams that are all going to be in the playoffs. They have impact-level stars. And most of their stars, non-quarterback on offense, are, you know, uh, playmaking guys with the ball in their hand. And I, I just think sometimes you're not trying to, quote-unquote, hip, swivel, drop, hurt them. You're just trying to get them to the ground. Why? That's literally your job description. Make an open field tackle. And for every, like, Ray Lewis, Patrick Willis, and Luke Keekley that's like, shit, I can tackle anybody in space. Most guys, it's like, I'm just trying to get the guy to the ground by any means necessary. So I, my issue more is part of the old school football was, you know, to in, injure guys. You weren't trying to necessarily like knock them out for the season or even the game, but you were trying to inflict legitimate pain. You're never coming over across the middle. You, you're, you're, your quarterback is never going to throw that route you know, between the underneath corner and the safety because we will clean your clock, right? This is, no one's thinking that. Real time, all of a sudden, a sweep and Alvin Kamara's in space. You're like, shit, can I just get the guy to the ground so we can get off the field? With the Cowboys not extending Dak Prescott, well, yet, I mean, they they keep claiming they're going to, and the quiet offseason they're having, Could they be quietly doing a rebuild that would see them part ways with Dak, sign CD and Parsons next offseason and surround another quarterback, rookie or veteran with stud pieces around them, much like the 49ers? I would imagine that McCarthy would be replaced by Ben Johnson or a Belichick-type coach that can win with that type setup. I... uh, I don't think Jerry at this point in time is trying to rebuild. I think they had to make some tough financial decisions. They pay their own guys a ton. Even if you remove Dak, whose cap hit is huge, right? Lawrence's cap hits big. CD Lamb's cap hit is big. Uh, Zach Martin's cap hit is big. I mean, they, they have high pro bowl level guys or guys that have been to pro bowls that make a lot of money. So I I think it's more in in kind of that world than it is kind of a a rebuild. Now, is it a little bit of a reset? 100%. And you can reset. This is why I said the Bills uh, Super Bowl window, it it doesn't close as long as you have Josh Allen because he's good enough to compete at the highest level, right? But you look at uh, Dak Prescott, I just don't think he is. Like, if your team is not good enough, 
I don't think you can. I don't think you can compete. I, I don't think you can make runs in the playoffs. I mean, hell, their team has been relatively stacked these last what three years. I mean, they've had a lot of talent up and down their roster, offensively, defensively, players at every level. Been bouncing the first round two of the last three years at home. Now their team is going to be less talented. They're going to be very dependent on young players. Very dependent on hitting guys in the draft. Very dependent on guys they've drafted the last couple of years taking big steps. You know, a guy that we don't quite see coming, becoming like a high-end starter. A guy that's a fringe high-end starter like the... What's the, what's the guy that they drafted to basically... I mean, he's going to replace Tyron Smith at, at left tackle. Like, he, can he become a pro bowler? Um... Uh, if he can, then they're in pretty good shape. If he can't, they're probably in trouble. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. For the mailbag, why do you think the Chargers are not included? Global market programs. So it's basically just teams that have signed guys from the international uh, world. So it's, I just don't think they, it, it's hard to describe on a, uh, on a podcast, but there's just a picture of all the teams that have international players. The Rams have a bunch. Uh, the 49ers have this guy from Mexico that's been on their practice squad forever. I, I don't know every team. I, for whatever reason, the chart, you, you basically get a free roster spot. If you bring in an international player, I would imagine if we went through it, most of them are practice squad guys. Now with the extended practice squad, plus this guy does not count. Like you get an extra practice squad spot, but most of these guys are not going to be Jordan Malata. <laughs> You're basically just trying out a guy. You probably like him. Uh, but when it comes to the chargers, I don't necessarily, I don't I don't know. Listen to the Titans trade reaction. I wanted to give my idea on why they may be doing it. If you think it works. Put the pieces around him to create a successful offense and a winning team and a strong culture. If it does not work out, you have the building blocks of a destination for free agency. New stadium, energetic fan base, weapons where you need them under contract, no state taxes, and a new culture that seems to be aligned. Do you think that will be enough to persuade a quarterback to sign, or are they doomed if Levis flames out? Well, I think you're 100% right. They're just signing good, high-level players from winning organizations. Tony Pollard's been used to winning in Dallas. Calvin Ridley, a little bit of a different story, but Snead is back-to-back -back Super Bowl champion. Right, He's been a three-year starter on one of the best teams in the league. So I, I think it's about signing high-level guys, even if you have to pay a little bit. The Titans would 100% be a, a destination for free agents. Right, not even just the no state. Nashville's a fucking incredible place. Think how many players in the NFL are from the South. If the teams in the South have cap space, they can land players starting in Texas over. That's why if the Cowboys ever had money, they never do because they always sign their own guys. If they ever had money, they would land dudes, right? The Texans, money, land dudes. Titans, money, they will land dudes. Both Florida teams, money, land dudes. Atlanta, they have money, land dudes. Like New Orleans, if they ever had money, they never do because their cap's always fucked up. They would land dudes. Well, I think how many players in the NFL are from either the ACC or the SEC? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, it's pretty, pretty large. Another hip drop question. Hip drop band. Where are we going to stop all this shit? At first, it started with the head injuries, and we have seen season, career, ending, lower body injuries skyrocket. Now we have digressed all the way to this. At what point does it become flag football? This is ridiculous. Well, I think we have to separate everything, right? 
the leading with the crown of your helmet in the open field, safeties and linebackers, they clearly didn't want that. And that's out. Then the treatment of the quarterbacks jumped the shark, but at least they had a reason for it. No one wants to watch a game if Mahomes and Allen, if the Bills and Chiefs are playing and one of the two guys is hurt. People get hurt in football. But if it can be avoided, you have to keep that position safe. You do. Ideally, are some of these roughing the passers ridiculous? No one would argue that. Does it have the right intention for us, the consumer? It does. The hip drop tackle, I, I just think we have to watch how this play plays out. I, I, I really do. If it's aggressive, then we're going to have a problem. If it's just finding guys, like, I don't care. And that's what I would imagine it ends up being, just kind of finding guys. I hope. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm not going to overreact until I see it. Do I like it? No. Would I have not done it? 100%. But it was clear a couple weeks ago when Troy Vincent and the league was talking, their mindset on it all. Like, they were getting rid of it. It was going to be gone. And now, obviously, it's gone. But we'll see. One thing to say something, another thing to put it into action. They're very aggressive on the head stuff, right? They're very aggressive with the quarterbacks. Are they going to be this aggressive with the uh, with the hip drop tackle? It doesn't happen as much, but we're going to find out. Does it make much sense for college football to restructure itself like an English football pyramid? This would make much more drama all around and hope for the little schools while keeping the big boys making their money all while giving multiple Cinderella stories and streamlining the recruiting. The top 16 to 20 teams could receive the biggest cut of the revenue shares, while each tier below receives a smaller and smaller cut. The bottom three teams each year would face relegation to the tier below, while the top three teams, determined through the playoffs, would get to move up, receive a bigger share, while becoming more attractive for recruits. It would create layers to coaching in the NFL draft. Would love to hear your thoughts. In theory, that makes a lot of sense. But the problem is the two main leagues, why are they incentivized to open their arms to the Big 12 or the ACC? Now, you can say in the Big 10, Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, you know, in theory, Iowa, obviously now Oregon, USC, they're all kind of in it together. And then the SEC, Bama, Right, Ole Miss, LSU, Georgia, Tennessee. It's all too separated. One thing the NFL has going for it, and I don't know the structure well enough in soccer, but the they're all partners. So when the season ended, Clark Hunt and Jed York, the two teams in the Super Bowl, got the same amount of money from the television rights deal that the Carolina Panthers, Washington Commanders, and the Patriots, the teams drafting one, two, and three. They got the same check. Now, I think it comes over, you know, three or four months. But you know what I mean. They all got, I don't know the exact number, but it's like $400 million. might have been 405 They're partners. This podcast, with the volume. When I make money, Colin makes money. We're all making money to get, we're all incentivized here to do well. The Big Ten... Like, what is their incentive to help out the Big 12? Now, if they have teams that can help them, then they would try to steal them. But to try to merge, they don't need them. That's the whole problem with the structure of college football. It's all, and that's why it feels inevitable that it goes SEC, Big 10, and teams keep joining the two of them. Like Notre Dame eventually drones the Big 10, Florida State, Clemson, the SEC, Maybe Kansas has a sleeper because of their basketball program, but football is so much bigger. It's just a very complicated situation. It's not normal business because of the segregation that already exists. And there's not, I mean, there's not equality in the NFL either. Obviously the Carolina Panthers mean a lot less to the NFL than the Dallas Cowboys. But in terms of the money they all generate together, for the thing that pays most of their bills, the television contract, they're all in it together. They're all hand in hand. They're equal partners in college football. There's not equal partners. And the other thing is why would the sec or the big 10 ever sign up for relegation? I always love, and listen, I, I get why it's fun conversation, 
when the media brings up relegation, no one in pro, no owner is ever going to sign up for relegation. David Tepper might be the worst owner we've ever seen. He just paid billions of dollars for his team. How would he ever sign a piece of paper that he could be kicked out of the league? As a Clemson's fan and now a Jags fan, do you see Trevor improving from what was a lackluster second half, or do you think Peterson giving up play calling was part of the second half collapse? Love the pod. I clicked on a video today. Who was it with? Garofolo or one of the guys at the owner's meeting was talking with Doug, and Trevor came up. And he says the number one thing next year with Trevor, before even the quote-unquote play, is the health. He said he has to do a better job avoiding unneeded hits. Us as a staff need to do a better job of avoiding those situations. And we need to work together to avoid injuries. Now, that's easier said than done. But he also kind of alluded to, like, we're bringing in a backup quarterback that if he does get hurt, the guy can play. So their goal is going to be, clearly they're not going to pay Trevor Lawrence this offseason, but if he's injured, like they traded for Mac Jones for a reason. He has a lot of experience. And even Doug mentioned, like he turned on his rookie season, like I felt pretty good about that player. So I, I think they're going to wait and see. It's going to be on Trevor to be available and prove that he's a high-end guy. If he's not, I, I don't believe he's on scholarship. I, I really don't. That's not the way the NFL works. We, hell, we've seen every guy in this draft. Justin Fields, another team. Trey Lance, another team. Mac Jones on the Jags. Zach Wilson, he makes too much. They can't even trade him. They're going to have to cut him. So now you could argue Trevor Lawrence was viewed in a different tier, and that's true. But if he does not play well, he will not be on the team. It's just that simple. Now, maybe Doug and everyone gets fired as well, but Trevor better pick it up because that's just simply not good enough. I was just reading a fascinating article on The Athletic. It cited numerous sources from the NFL and college football who actually pointed to a player's, well, butt size as an indicator of lower body strength. The story, the story seems to make it clear he has a physical attribute evaluated on prospects for a while, as humorous as it comes across. Do you have any recollections to the attention to a rear end in your time scouting? Reaction to the concept. We called it the bubble. He has a big bubble. Now, obviously, at certain positions, it's more important. Guard, tackle, center, defensive tackle. You don't want a defensive back to have a big butt. But And running back. You know, some running backs, they were lower body. Debo Samuel, if you, I've been stood next to him a million times at practice, like his lower body is built much more like a running back than most wide receivers. So I, I don't think it's like measuring their butt, but their, their butt into their lower part of their legs. Like this is a very, very physical sport. And as a running back and as someone on the line of scrimmage, that fucking, the power in your ass through your thighs, I mean, separates the men from the boys. I mean, this is the, the job of an offensive lineman is to move a body in front of them. And the job of a defensive lineman is to move that body moving forward backwards. And obviously, as a running back, it's about breaking a lot of contact. So for every stiff, like, you don't stiff arm as many guys as you think. This isn't Madden football. It's, it's breaking tackles through your lower body strength. It's why squatting, you know, remember when Saquon was so famous about squatting whatever, 600 pounds. Same with Jalen Hurts. Jalen's a good example. He's got a thick lower body. And that's important to the way he plays. The tush push doesn't exist without his lower body strength. So, yeah, it's... Discussed a lot. When I was scouting, you would you do 99% of your work, right? <clears throat> Evaluate the tape, talk to all the contacts at the school, do your write-up, character, football intelligence, ability. And then you would go to practice. And you would try to stand next to the player. And you go, God, this guy looks the part. And you would kind of describe his body. And if it doesn't look the part, that also can be a problem. Now, just because you don't look the part doesn't mean you can't play in the NFL. But at certain positions, it's hard to be 150-pound running back. It's hard to be a 275-pound offensive lineman, right? There, there are certain things that, that translate when it comes to football. Huge fan of the pod. Been listening for a few years now. 
I always refer refer to your takes when debating with my family. Hopefully I've helped you win some arguments. Anyways, my 49er fan friends are claiming to me that Purdy is better than Herbert. I called him insane, and then somehow my other friends joined in and agreed with him. Their argument is that each quarterback accomplished and how much playoff success he's had. Brock Purdy has been a revelation. He's been one of the most impressive things we've ever seen. I mean, he's on a very, very short list. Going back to Brady, pick 199 in 2000. Tony Romo, undrafted free agent. It's very, very rare that a guy in the 6th, 7th, undrafted free agent ever has success at quarterback. It's not usually how it works, right? Most NFL starting quarterbacks are top, are first rounders, let alone top 100 pick. Think about the best players right now at quarterback. Mahomes, first rounder. Lamar, first rounder. Herbert, first rounder. Josh Allen, first rounder. Jalen Hurts, second rounder. Uh, then there are some outliers, Dak, Cousins, mid-round guys, fourth rounders. Uh, who, I, I'm no, I'm missing Kyler Murray, first rounder. Matt Stafford, first rounder. Like just, just kind of go around the, and I know I'm leaving guys. Joe Burrow, first rounder. I mean, high pick. So a, a lot of guys that have success at the highest level are really, really high picks. Deshaun Watson before he fell off a cliff, first rounder. So. When you're going to be a late-round pick, you're very dependent, and luckily, you can go to good teams. Tom Brady went to a really, really talented team. Uh, Tony Romo, uh, you know, it escapes me how good they were early on. They had Bill Parcells. Like, who your coach is, who your play caller is, like, that helps. That, that matters. So, would Purdy be as good if I threw him on the Carolina Panthers? Of course not. But Purdy, with the 49ers, has been damn good. It's not debatable. Herbert has had Brandon Staley and Anthony Lynn as his two coaches. Anthony Lynn will never be a head coach in the NFL again. I'll never say never on Brandon Staley because he's still pretty young. But if he's if anyone ever hires him again, they're on crack cocaine. So he has two guys that will never be a head coach again. Their organization, let's face it, has been kind of a weird place. That should change now with Jim and Joe Horowitz from the Ravens. Hopefully they can stabilize it. But the Chargers, even under Phillip Rivers, just a bizarre, a lot of talent around them. But now it's time to now it's time to see. I think Herbert has a chance to be a star under Jim Harbaugh. Physically, he's in a different universe than her than Purdy. And for a while, I was like, well, Purdy doesn't throw any picks. Well, Purdy throws some picks. <laughs> now he can throw a lot of touchdowns too, but Herbert should be a better player moving forward than Brock Purdy. If the 49ers called the Chargers and said straight up, Purdy for Herbert, the Chargers say no. The 49ers, while they love Brock Purdy, would have to make that trade. I mean, they they just would. And I love Brock Purdy. But, and honestly, as it ages, maybe it goes the other way. Maybe Herbert's never quite as good as we all think. The NFL thinks he's good. If you polled NFL teams, he would be viewed as a top five quarterback in the NFL. Like if the team had a chance to draft from scratch. Fair or not, Brock Purdy would not. Kyle might view him that way, but Justin Herbert universally would be. So Brock Purdy's had more success than Justin Herbert. Not debatable. Because his team, he just, he played... If you put Justin Herbert with the 49ers, like they're having as much, if not more, success. I got to say, as a man from the Land Park area in Sacktown, it's fucking awesome to see another guy from the Valley killing it. I love Davis, especially the women there. I don't know if anyone's ever said that, but... But anyways, in high school, we had good talent. But when I I was in high school, I'm not talking now. I'm 40 years old. I'm saying when I was a kid. Uh, but the, I don't think the school is exactly, you know, Arizona State. But but I hear you. I love that area. I saw this cool. The Colts put something out. Shane Steichen, he's from he's from Sacramento. He married his high school sweetheart, and he was wearing a Chris Weber jersey back in, you know, he's a, like I think a year older than me. Kings were sweet back then. So it's it's always cool to see. I always root from people from the 916. 
But anyways, as a Patriot fan, it makes me want to eat a bullet seeing how many fans want to trade for Fields or pay Baker Mayfield. To me, it seems significantly better to swing with a future quarterback. I don't think this is that old. Maybe he's just maybe he hasn't been on the internet. <clears throat> taking a receiver late. Is there a benefit to taking a smaller contract with one of these dudes? Well, Baker Mayfield's on the Tampa Bay uh, Bucks. I almost said Rays. And Justin Fields is obviously on the Pittsburgh Steelers. But I think the Patriots are going to think long and hard about trading back. I really think so. And if they don't love one of these quarterbacks, whoever the guy that is not taking it to, whether that's, you know, Drake May sitting there, Jaden Daniels sitting there, J.J. McCarthy, if they don't feel like that guy's a franchise quarterback, I think they're going to be in the business of trading back. And I think a lot of Patriot fans are going to be pissed. And they're cool with, like, resetting the franchise this year, adding some talent, and just playing with, like, Jacoby Brissett. I definitely think that's on the table. Now, do I think they, if I was a betting man, do I think they end up taking a quarterback? I do. But these discussions and these trade calls, even Gerard Mayo said, we're open for business. Adam Peters was asked. He's like, yeah, we're not open for business. We've talked, but this is not pick is not available. The first two picks, they never even pretended the pick was available. Every team, three and four, you know, the Cardinals have Kyler, but the Patriots like, yeah, we're listening. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? And in fairness, if they don't love, you don't, can't just take a quarterback, take a quarterback. Chris Ballard said this forever. Everyone's like, why don't you just take a quarterback? Because I don't like the guys that are there when I draft. Like, I know you guys don't want me to take a quarterback, but if there's not a quarterback there that I like, what am I supposed to do? And he's right. Don't do anything. Write it out. And then see how it plays out, and then you get Anthony Richardson. Now, he better be the guy. It puts a lot of pressure on him, but I, I think the Colts are a major wild card, or excuse me, the Patriots are a major wild card here. Everyone's picking them to take quarterback, and it's logical. But you, you never know. And when their coach is talking like that, I don't think he's randomly talking like that. I think they're just trying to put all their options on a whiteboard and kind of see what they think is the best option. So they're a fascinating team to watch, you know, over the next month, see if they do something. 